So, so we're going to continue with uh, discussion for for this session. Then we'll follow by a roundtable. We'll have lunch after, right uh, at lunch. If everyone, before we go to lunch, we'll take a quick group photo um, to to share with the world. Um, and then after lunch, we'll return. And then after lunch, will be an opportunity for all of you to give us feedback uh, as funders in terms of the uh, possible new directions of the field. I'm sorry, I'm unclear. So I made a, um, a spreadsheet for people going to the airport after the meeting. So if people want to sign up at what time and which airport, look in your email boxes and it's just a Google sheet you can sign into so that people can sort of coordinate travel. Thanks. Okay, great. Oh, five seconds. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is our panel discussion on families, populations, and societies. Um, I'm happy to introduce our panel. And I'll start with uh, Arbel Harpak. He's an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Austin in health informatics, data science, and integrative biology. Uh, his research program has a focus recently on genotype by environment interactions and complications of what he calls SAD effects, stratification, assortative mating, and dynastic effects. Daphne Marchenko, assistant professor in biomedical ethics at Stanford. She's an expert on the complexities of working on sensitive social traits, the ethical dimensions of studies on complex traits in humans. Melinda Mills, uh, who is joining us online from Oxford, uh, where she is uh, director of uh, the Leverhulm Center for Demographic Science. Um, she's been uh, focused recently on biobank scale studies of complex traits given a lot of thought to gene environment correlations in particular in the context of some of the discussions we'll have here today. And then Carl Veller, who is um, uh, standing in for Alex Young uh, and is an assistant professor at uh, the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago. And uh, Carl is a theoretician who recently has been doing work on understanding family-based designs and some of the uh, complexities of those uh, design strategies. So um, to facilitate the discussion, we're going to uh, go back and forth between the panel and the room and try to facilitate some, uh, uh, you know, whole room discussion. So I'll try to cue a sort of time for new questions versus opening up to the floor for discussion. And um, I have several questions here. And uh, the first one um, uh, is queued up nicely by some of the studies we heard this morning. So uh, Loic in particular mentioned in his talk how family studies may be a productive future avenue for research. And uh, so there are uh, big questions in terms of, uh, you know, thinking in the future oriented perspective of this meeting about family based study designs and um, in what ways are they useful for illuminating genetic architecture of traits. Will they get us fully out of the challenges of, of uh, confounding and stratification. Um, and uh, for what kinds of problems are population based GWAS is still um, a useful way forward. Um, so we'll start on that theme with uh, the panelists and then um, take comments from the floor. All right, so does anybody want to jump in here first? Panel, maybe Carl, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to touch on something that came up in uh, Loic's keynote and in Peter Fisher's question. Carl. Move the mic closer and speak. Because okay, speak sorry, loudly. I'll speak yeah. louder. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to touch on something that came up in Loeg's keynote and in Peter Fisher's question, um, and which I think deserves further discussion in the context of the topic of this session, and that's the difference between um, the sort of standard traditional population based association study and a family association study. Even louder. So I think we all appreciate that family studies can control for much of, not all of, but much of um, the genetic and environmental confounding and family indirect effects that are a problem for population based association studies, and which I think we're also a little more circums circumspect about our ability to control for now. Um, so I think we all recognize that family based studies are indispensable in estimating direct genetic effects. 
Um, but I think they also come with a bunch of issues that are less well appreciated. Um, so in some of the debate around Paige Harden's recent book, um, Molly Chavorsky and Graham Coop uh, argued that perhaps the growing focus on family-based studies is moving us away from uh, the sort of basic questions that motivated our interest in GWAS in the first place. And I think that's very provocative. I think it's true in a bunch of ways. Um, some are relatively straightforward. Um, I think um, family studies are influenced, or some, some study designs of family studies are influenced by sibling indirect effects in a way that population studies aren't. I think sample ascertainment has different um, biases in family-based studies versus population-based studies. And I think maybe more subtly, in the presence of gene by environment interactions, about which we heard a lot yesterday and today, um, the fact that family-based studies are sampling a different subset of the genetic variation relative to population-based studies means that potentially they're subsampling a different distribution of environments or genetic backgrounds, and therefore a different distribution of effects. Um, and so I think we need to recognize, of course, that there's some things that family-based studies can't measure, but we also need to do a, a bunch more work to try to understand precisely what family-based studies are measuring. Thanks, Carl. Melinda, do you want to chime in on this question? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I broadly agree with, with uh, what you were saying, but I think it also has to do with the trait as well, right? So whether a family-based design is useful or not. And I think um, Arbel was going to talk about, <laughs> you know, the, the big problem with GWAS, which we all know the population stratification and assortative mating and, and these indirect parental genetic effects. And then I think they can be really useful, you know, especially, you know, going really practically thinking about if you could do estimate these trio GWASs with um, offspring and spouses or some of the sibling models. Um, you know, like the trio models, they can they can show and they they can show you um, what amount of genetic confounding you have. And I think, you know, it's really been shown, and I think that's in the next panel that we're going to talk about this. That you're going to have, um, um, you know, issues, and it, it will be more important or more relevant for the more complex behavioral traits, um, which Abdul was talking about as well. And I, I agree about the family models, and and then that's been a focus, but I. As, as um, Bogdan and, and Jen and some of the other um, speakers spoke about, I think actually more diversity yes. in samples across geography, across life's core stages and ages and socioeconomics groups, I think that's probably the, the stronger way forward. And I can, I'll, I'll stop now because I know you want to have more discussion, but studies like Our Future Health, the new 5 million um, study that, that I'm involved in and many of us are in the UK, that's oversampling low socioeconomic groups and um, different ethnicities. It's important, but it's a different UK uh, migration history in the UK as well, too, from the US and other countries. So yeah, you get more diversity, but completely different diversity, not relevant um, according to the country. Great, thanks, Melinda. Um, Arbel, do you wanna chime in as well? Uh, thank you, Melinda and Carl and John. Uh, so, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what I have to contribute. I feel like most of uh, my areas of expertise are uh, much better covered by uh, folks in the room. So I'm glad that you uh, defined sadness as my expertise, because <laughs> uh, I do have expertise and uh, vast experience. Um, so, you know, I, wa I want to uh, zoom out just a little bit before that and give sort of my my two cents on a uh, general theme of the, the meeting as I see it, as, you know, genetic architecture and how that depends on context. Uh, so I think, um, you know, in order to also think about where uh, the money should go, we should uh, start by defining some of the holy grails um, of this question. Um, and, you know, to me, you know, while important, like, you know, it's not a holy grail to, to improve uh, R square um, by by three percent, and so you know I think you know a holy grail to to suggest is is or or sort of you know so, something that we should champion as geneticists is mechanism, and and that's a sense in which we should care about context uh, dependency, 
and of course, you know, strive towards uh, generalizable uh, uh, answers. And you know, and I think in that respect, uh, what we're uh, we're uh, missing a lot is uh, theory of how uh, genetics depend, genetic effects depend on environment and depend on context. And and and, and I think that's true for both the, the molecular and cellular level and the uh, the environmental exposure and, and, and social uh, level, um, and, and and you know something else that that uh, th that I think we're missing alongside theory is uh, pretty strong case studies that we can start and, and generalize from, and um, and in that respect, I think you know some of the work that was uh, discussed yesterday uh, from uh, Francesca Luca from from NASA, uh, Sinat Armstrong from. Um, from Jonathan's uh, Jonathan Pritchard's lab uh, is, you know, is, is really great uh, first steps in, in that direction. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll. Uh, I'm much more interested to hear what Daphne has to add. Yeah. Uh, just a couple, hopefully you can hear me, and this is on. Uh, just a couple things that I wanted to add. One is which uh, I think. Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, but you and Graham had a preprint that came out like yesterday on within family confounding and Carl's on it too. Awesome. Okay. So I just wanted to shout that out. But the other thing that I was going to say, which I think picks up on what Jen had mentioned in her presentation when she talked about reflecting on the questions that we ask, who we include in the systems that we model. Um, and I think another thing to add on that, in addition to thinking about, you know, what context are being captured and what are not, what people are we including and what people are we not including. Also thinking about, and I think maybe this touches on some of what Abdul mentioned in his talk, but what are the downstream implications of uh, the data that we generate and, and produce? Um, I think sometimes it can be difficult to bring back into the forefront of our minds the fact that the data that we work with in genomics come from humans um, and thinking about what are the implications of this work that we're doing for those humans that have given their data in the first place. And I think, you know, we heard in Bogdan's talk reflecting on, well, you know, if, if we're implementing polygenic scores without calibration, there are, and I know Alicia also talked about this, there are health equity implications for this. So um, just as my bioethics hat on in the room here, uh, encouraging, encouraging us all to also think about the downstream implications of the work that we do and the human beings that will be affected by these studies that we've been hearing from over the course of the last two days. Great, thank you. Okay, so on this, um topic of, of family-based designs. Um, Follow-up questions, comments from the floor in terms of uh, the advantages, <laughs> disadvantages of these designs. I have a follow-up question Carl's comment about family-based designs potentially sampling a subset of the context. Is that uh, largely from a kind of ascertainment bias of the inevitably having, uh, uh, well, uh, you, know, you have a subsample of your large cohort that might have um, enrolled as families and that being sort of biased in who, you know, which families fully enroll versus the larger cohort, or is there something more subtle? I just wanted you to expand on that. No, that, that would certainly be an example. Um, <clears throat> what I had in mind there um, is that, is that so the genetic variation that subsampled in families is specifically, or specifically families, a subsample that can produce within family genetic variation because that's what within family association studies and other genetic studies are using, and that's and so that sort of upweights certain families relative to others, and if those families are living in environments that interact with genetic effects, then by Upweighting those families, you're you're upweighting your um, sampling of those potentially unusual genetic effects, and so the the overall estimate that you get out maybe doesn't reflect the population as a whole, and wouldn't be what you'd get if you you know in like a perfect world if you had a an unconfounded population study. It's not what you'd estimate from that study. Okay, and then one more clarifying question: the upweighting of those families. How is that happening? Is that it because of the need for heterozygosity in the parents? Or no, it's yeah. exactly that. It's exactly that. So I mean, if you take a if you take an association study at a single locus, um, and you perform that 
in the population as a whole, and sample taken from the population as a whole, then you essentially see all of the genetic variation at that locus, and you try and associate that with trait variation in the sample. But if you're only looking within families, you require that to be within family genetic variation, and that can only be provided by parents who are heterozygous at the locus in question. And those families might have an unusual distribution across environments. Okay, great. We will all have to read more in this preprint that just came out. Um, okay, so um, any more comments from the floor on family-based designs? Yeah, Peter. Um, just a, a, a general comment for discussion, really. So if you listen to yesterday and then today, uh, one conclusion one might draw is that G by E is ubiquitous in for human traits. But what, what's the what's the actual primary evidence for that? It, it's it. You know, if we look at the specific context where you can where people have looked at um, quantifying interactions like a genetic correlation, for example, between traits in males and females at the population level, or uh, age, young and older people, people have done that. Yes, you find some, but by and large, these correlations across these contexts are very, very large. Um, so my, my question is, what's the, what's the primary evidence there's interactions rather than there's environmental eff effects, which are like, uh, you know that we know that we normally try to adjust for where you do a GWAS, like effect of you know of sex, of age, of uh, where you live, or which SNP array you use, or whatever that kind of stuff. How much, how much um, interaction is there? Real, you know, interaction. That's a question. Melinda, do you want to go or Arbel? I think you could be natural on this. I can't, Arbel, you're really small on my screen. So if you're nodding, if you want to go first or otherwise, shall I go? I, I'm only a tiny bit bigger here, but uh, yeah, you can go. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, probably gigantic on your screen. Yeah, so um, yeah, um, Peter, it's a really good point. I mean, and it's, I think Arbel was also talking about we need to think deeperly uh, in deeper terms um, theoretically, but I also, think we have to speak in deeper terms um, in statistical thinking about this too. So how can we pull out that evidence of interactions and, and um, you know, how can we piece out what's environmental effects or not? And I, sorry if I sound like a repeating myself, but I think it really differs in terms of like whether it's a complex behavioral trait or not. And that, and then the family models become more important in that um, way as well too. And I, I think, you know, we're thinking we're using polygenic scores now to study sort of moderating and mediating roles of um, environment and genetic confounding. And then I think you run into a lot of issues. And I think we just have to think a lot in deeper terms about, you know, and I've wrote about thought about this before about problems of conditioning on a collider and collider bias and spurious associations. And you can really run into a lot of issues. So I think we really need to scrutinize this more deeper. Um, statistical terms to figure out what's the relevance or importance of the polygenic score and the covariates and do you have endogenous selection bias um you know what are the what's all of this hidden heterogeneity because i think there's a lot of things underlying the relationship between the covariates with the outcomes and the g by e interdependence and the g by e interaction. so yeah i think there's a lot more that has to be done in statistical terms too great okay um our belt. And then, yeah. Um, so, so I guess you know the, the question can be addressed uh, uh, both in terms of uh, sort of you know priors in the absence of uh, data, and then you know what data we we need. And in terms of priors in the absence of data, I guess um, you know I don't know why we should uh, expect the effects, the genetic effects, causal genetic effects, to be different between two different uh, ancestry groups when you know they're largely the same as, as uh, in mouse. Um, and, you know, on the other hand, we have, you know, all the evidence uh, in the, the world that, uh, and, and, you know, a million, a billion dollar industry and in, uh, plants uh, based on uh, G by E being 
being um, a thing in, in virtually any other organism where we can control and manipulate uh, environments. So, you know, that's where my prior comes from, and that's before kind of considering uh, humans also being a little more complex uh, than, than plants in some ways. Um, and, and, and in terms of data, I think, you know, uh, you know, hardly my prior or anyone else should, should prevent us from, for, from uh, looking for those case studies and starting from there. And, and, and you know, and I think uh, in the population level, uh, you know, uh, when, I think we're, we're going to discuss some, uh, the diversification of, of GWAS and, uh, later on, but, you know, uh, I think all of the, the conversation about that has been uh, largely guided by diversifying GWAS in terms of genetic uh, or just in terms of race, actually. Uh, and and I'm unaware of large efforts that are guided by diversifying contexts, be that you know environmental or social uh, contexts. Um, so so I think that data is largely missing, and um, and also really you know thinking about this at the mechanistic uh, level of uh, you know so, so questions that uh, some very deep questions that uh, came up in the discussion yesterday is include you know our uh, uh, environmental or, or context, or sorry, environmental effects are they funneled through the same pathways as genetic effects? And you know, if if they are, does it you know make sense to start with an uh, uh, with a model of, of uh, additivity of environment and, and genetics? Uh, so, so you know, I think I think we're uh, lacking on both uh, data and, and theory. Let's go, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce Walsh. Your, your, your comment about plants brings up an important point. Um, we know a lot about G by N plants because we can replicate, therefore detect it. But the other thing is, if your environment sucks, if you're a plant, the environment's terrible. There's nothing you can do to deal with it. So plants evolve to handle that. If you're an animal and the environment's bad on a, on a micro environmental scale, you deal with the behavior. So one of the interesting features is a lot of G by E is handled in animals and mitigated by behavior. And so when we talk about the G by E of something that mitigates G by E, it's another way to think about something on that. Um, in, in animals, we see G by E, but only under extreme conditions. If you look at uh, the milk yield of cows in New York State and in Mexico, it's the same genetic ranking. You have to move them to Thailand where they're suffering from severe uh, heat stress to get a, a decent G by E, a re-ranking of the uh, genotypes. So the, the evidence from uh, domestic animals is that the G by E's are only important if you make a massive change in the environment. Okay, so maybe I'll use that as a segue. Well, uh, um, well, let's say I, I want to make sure this um, we move to uh, some other subjects. Um, it's kind of been fun about this meeting that it's, it's become the genetic architecture of G by E, or so, sort of so heavily emphasized. But one of the one of the questions I think is is uh, important on the table. Of course, this is all related to G by E, of course, but in fact, but the question of um, diverse sampling and um, and as we look towards more samples, um, this question. Uh, that's sort of uh, posed from from the, uh, the, the the accumulation of all these um, surveys ahead of time, and, and is sort of in the room as well. Um, so, in constructing more diverse cohorts, should we be you know the, the emphasis on sampling more diversity in terms of genetic variation versus environmental variation? And it, it's a segue from your your comment in terms of is some of this because we are not we don't have the variables to stratify by environments. We don't have the environmental um, uh, the, the cohorts that, that are diverse enough in those dimensions. So um, in that regard, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to extend the question So, uh, to Arbel. So Arbel started with the prior, but I wonder if you could comment about the posterior from human studies about the, what we know about the importance of G by E, or at least the current posterior. Um.
so, so so I can give uh, and you know perhaps talk about this is in, with an, the example of um, of, of uh, sex dependent uh, genetic effects uh, where uh, we've we, we've tried to develop um, a new way of fusing our, our GWAS data to uh, to look at at uh, how genetic effects differ between males and females uh, as you know the estimate of interest and and do that uh, you know in a in a, in a polygenic framework uh, and 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 um, and and what what we see is uh, is oftentimes at odds with what the the literature uh, before um, has has shown and I think you know part of that is. Uh, is really just like you know trying to shift uh, the the methodology to thinking about uh, complex traits and and how um, and and and, and uh, um, you know somewhat inspired by by the work that uh, that has been done following the the omnigenic model and what the omnigenic model proposes, which you know one of the the, the biggest um, takeaways for me at least was. Um, uh, was that we do need to uh, to look at it in a different way, and, and you know the, the generalization cannot uh, be done from um, from single from side by side, looking you know side by side and generalizing from that, but actually uh, going down a level and thinking about you know a systems uh, uh, systems biology, uh, thinking about about sort of you know gene interaction network uh, to to better understand the the GWAS data as well, um, but. Yeah, and so we, we do see uh, lots of uh, gene by sex interacting, for example, in uh, in traits that were previously considered to to not be sex dependent uh, because of you know sort of like perfect or near perfect genetic correlations between males and females, or because of high concordance of uh, GWAS hits. So we we just think that it's not a complete way of, of understanding uh, interactions. Um, but you know, if I could uh, even like you know give uh, give up the whole uh, retrospective study of the, you know, like wonderful UK Biobank, and uh, get, you know, div uh, data from uh, early development um, uh, or or or, um, or or IPSCs, you know, and, and ask that question uh, there. Then I would, you know, do that in a second. Can I add something on this um, point? Yes. Okay. No one's saying no. Um, so, yeah, no, I just wanted to talk about that, that sort of the massive changes in environment as well that was raised before in relation to animal versus human studies. And I think, you know, um, this is where, where it gets really tricky and we keep having problems with this, with the study of gene environment interaction, because you need this huge ex exogenous shock um, um, for humans. So um, Abdul was presenting the work about Estonia. So when when you had the Russian withdrawal, they completely redesigned their entire education system. Um, so they had a huge shock, or you'll have economic shocks, or you'll have changes in educational policy reforms, or all of these different things. So you can model it in some way where you have some sort of, you know, exogenous effect. But I think it's really hard if you think about it, like modeling it like an instrumental variable, it will always be really hard to isolate. And it'll always be related to multiple effects. And I think that's the, the difficulty with some of these, you know, um, gene environment interactions, you need huge samples in order to detect any sort of effect. And it's really hard to say, okay, well, is that, you know, can we isolate that causal effect, that policy, that change, that environmental factor. And I think um, the nice example was given by Jen about pollution, you know, so all of these different contexts, um, you know, um, uh, it, it, it just has a very different um, uh, contextual uh, aspect. But I think, you know, one promise could be looking at these really extreme exogenous events or different contextual factors. And, and that's been fairly successful in some studies. Uh, Magnus? A question in the back first. Okay. Uh, Magnus has his hand up for a while, actually. Or, okay. Um, oh, Magnus deferring. Okay, so go ahead. So I want to I want to follow up on that. I, I think one thing that, that that just came up with the plant examples, like well, in plants we'll have huge variation. There's like super high droughts, or uh, plants can't move. But there's like if you ask a demographer, most people can't move either. 
right? Most people's housing isn't as flexible that they can actually move. So that's sort of a bit of a misconception that people move a lot. And also, if we want these things uh, to work, I think Melinda gave sort of a, a start here by being a very, very sociologist about it, giving the sociological answer is maybe we're not the people to decide what environments to measure, right? I mean, we're here grappling with the idea of measuring environments, but none of us are, well, few of us are social scientists or the kind of people that actually do this for their day job, right? So are we the right people to do that part of the G by E? Should we be deciding what the E is in the G by E, or should we just be bringing the G? Yeah, great, that's a good segue. I wanted to um, set up Daphne for a question on um, the, the this aspect of interacting with social scientists and, and uh, the role that uh, social scientists might play in this kind of research going forward. You might have noticed in the RFA that's been posted, um, the R01 includes a, a plan for transdisciplinary uh, interaction. And so maybe Daphne, if you want to speak on those issues, it'd be great. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I think it was Francesca yesterday who said that, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I think that that speaks to exactly what you're saying, Michelle, about there are other people outside of this room who are experts in the environment and, and figuring out what contexts matter and how to measure the environment. And so um, I think that also picks up on what you're saying, John, about uh, there's a lot of conversation about interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Um, you know, the NHGRI strategic vision talks about this. The NHGRI strategic vision also talks about doing more work on the ethical, legal, social implications of research into complex traits. Um, but there's not a, a lot of meaningful collaboration between these entities. Um, and so I think, you know, Jen was talking about incentives. I think we need to recognize that the incentives that exist right now and the way that our funding mechanisms are structured um, really operate to have people who may have expertise in a social sciences or ethics related background, but they're still working in their silo within the larger um, consortia project. So um, I think that that's a kind of structural system level issue that's going to need to be grappled with. How do we work to ensure that when we bring in social scientists, when we bring in bioethics folks, that they're not positioned as the assistant to the scientist, uh, supposed to help them with research communication or figure out, you know, what are the downstream implications of it? Um, I, I do a lot of work trying to understand how genetics researchers and LC ethics people think about the goals and values of collaborations with each other. And I see time and time again that oftentimes there's a disconnect between what bioethics folks or social scientists think of the goals of these collaborations being and what genome scientists think the goals of these collaborations being. And I think part of that is driven by this incentive structure and what we value when it comes to tenure and promotion. Um, but if we are meaningfully wanting to do interdisciplinarity, then we're going to have to change those systems, I think. We have time for just one or two more comments. Uh, so let's do Magnus and then Loic, who both had their hands up for a while. Okay, Magnus is over here. Uh, yeah, I just want to push back slightly on the whole plants versus animals thing here. So it's true that there's a lot of local adaptation in plants, right? But I mean, in addition to working on plants, I'm also a card carrying evolutionary biologist, right? And, and, and there, you know, there's plenty of local adaptation in, in animals. And sticklebacks, for example, enormous reaction, you know, move them from salt water to fresh water, et cetera, right? There, there are lots of lots of effects there right so that's one point I, but the other thing i'm struck by when i listen to these discussions is i, I think it feels like the way we, environment is discussed there is often very simplistic in the sense of you know we think about it how much fertilizer you give a plant or how much feed you give cattle or something like that right they're completely exogenous things but many of the traits we're looking here in, in, in uh, you know, where humans really do stand out is that they literally inherit their phenotype, right? From socioeconomic status to language to a whole bunch of other things. And this is where I think you, one really needs to think slightly differently and question whether the models and frameworks that are applied make any sense at all. That's great. Okay, look. Uh, yeah, so just wanted to make two quick comments. Uh, one was to echo what you, your question, uh, John, about sampling and diversity. I was thinking this is actually very important. I'm thinking the context of some of the initiatives happening in, in Africa of you know, where where we know the genetic diversity is such that we're going to struggle to, to account for population stratifications and therefore we should be thinking in, as those initiatives are growing to essentially bring uh, family sampling 
uh, as soon as possible, because that's probably one of the best opportunity we'll have to deal with those uh, issues. So the second point was about, I guess, what Daphne just said. And I think I, usually when I enter this field as a sort of statistician, basic statistician, I heard about the boogeyman, you know, uh, population stratification. And and I think we should be embracing that boogeyman in some in some ways. And and the way to do that is to recognize that the stratification is a trait in a way. Abdel, I think, very nicely illustrated that, that those patterns that we see in those in those samples sometimes reflect ascertainment, but this is a trait. It is uh, and you know migration. This is a trait, and I think the more we will spend time thinking about and embracing that as a trait and, and pushing you know to better understanding that, I feel like that will probably ease our collaborations with uh, uh, social scientists. Great. Um, okay. In terms of time, we're going to let one more comment from Guy, and then we're going to stop. We're going to be able to continue the conversation in the roundtable run by Doc. But um, since we had a longer late start to the morning, we're shaving this off by 10 minutes and shaving the round table off by 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll be continuing to discuss. Guy, last comment on this panel before we get the round Well, table I, I just want to maybe um, emphasize uh, something that uh, Arbel said beyond, beyond the need for better data is that I think that the quantitative kinetics way of thinking of this expansion of residuals um, in terms of dealing with G by E might be uh, um, underpowered to detect uh, some types of environmental interactions just because they end up extending into deep uh, parts of the expansion in a way that you're always underpowered to see them, but actually finding better ways to model G by E and then analyze them, like Arbel mentioned this beautiful study about uh, the effects uh, of sex on traits uh, by taking a different kind of framework actually revealed a lot of uh, effects that couldn't have been seen before because of the modeling framework. And I wouldn't be surprised if when, when that is actually applied to humans where we have other independent evidence of how a social and uh, economic status and other factors usually influence uh, traits, then we would actually see it in the GWAS type studies. John, if I well, can I think that also add just. I really do want to uh, not cut off the round table. So um, I think the point that Guy just sent it on is, is sort of a good, we've, I think the discussion has surfaced a nice tension between these ways of modeling and thinking about G by E, and I think that's uh, maybe productive for us to think about going forward. So let's thank the panel. So now we'll be moving on to our, our roundtable discussion.
Is this on? Hello. Should we get going? All right, let's do this. Uh, okay, so this is the last roundtable. Uh, topic is quantitative versus qualitative differences in the genetic architecture of biological and social traits. Uh, I'm Doc Edge, and I'll just, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, say disciplinary back, background from which we're coming at this question, and to make a comment on one of our three questions, which aren't on the board yet, but I'll just say uh, the first big question is sort of what is a social or behavioral trait, uh, or is it a continuum? Is there some other factor that is the interesting thing that we should be keying in on? Are there important similarities and differences between behavioral traits and other kinds of traits? Uh, and, and the third question is, um, what do we need in terms of methods or, or conceptual frameworks or data uh, to understand uh, or intervene on, on more biological or more social traits? Um, so with that said, um, so Graham Coop was supposed to be on this panel. He wasn't able to be, but he has a comment uh, that I'll read after the panelists um, go through, but I'll ask all the panelists to say a couple of words. Jonathan, would you, uh, would you mind starting? Um, you mind starting? Should we go the other way? <laughs> sure. Mich Michelle, do you mind starting? <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind starting. Um, uh, so you want me to comment on one of these, right? I'm okay, my background is, is I'm a psychologist um, and, and a bit of an epidemi epidemiologist. And um, I'm taken, I was like inspired by uh, NASA Cenot Armstrong's talk yesterday, which basically lays bare the issue that none of these traits are any of these things, right? Because we had a SNP that influenced a response in your skin to a pathogen, so that's ecology, right? So we did genetics, biology, ecology, and then I guess the spread of the pathogen in the tick that works it, that's definitely, you know, I don't know, fish and wildlife control, whatever you want to do. And then whether people recognize that they're bit by a tick, that's like public health or, or information or education, like the entire causal chain could be interrupted in any of our disciplines, right? And so it may be the easiest interruption is just like public health. You just talk to people about tick bites and their, and their danger. Could also be that one of the other things is, is an easier intervention. And so that's just one SNP effect on one, one cancer uh, that that's transverses all like many of the disciplines sort of that could feasibly be related to it. So to think of the trade itself as any one of those things is just, to me, fairly weird. Alison? Sorry. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Alison Bell. I'm good. This one's closed. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I cannot tell you how much I have enjoyed this workshop. I have learned so much. I've taken so many notes. So I actually study animal behavior and I love plasticity, which I feel like might be a little bit of a bad word here because we're talking about G by E, but I actually haven't heard that much talk about plasticity. Um, but I actually think that how and why and when phenotypic variation arises, especially behavioral variation, is a super interesting, rich question. Um, and I like the messiness. And so it's been really fun to um, be a part of, of this workshop. I think uh, maybe the, the first point that I would want to speak to has to do with the distinction between social and biological. And I'd, I'd like to actually just question that distinction a little bit, because I think that the social can be biological and the biological can also be social. And I wonder how much we gain from making that distinction, especially because it can lead us back into some nature nurture traps that are not particularly productive when we're actually trying to think about how phenotypic variation um, arises. So there's really great examples about how social environments can influence biological processes. There's also really cool examples, of course, about how biology can influence social environments. So genetic variation and habitat selection, for example, different genotypes actively seek out or experience different social environments that can influence their phenotypic development. 
Um, so I think these lines are, are are really blurry, but I don't think that's bad news from my perspective. I actually think that's really interesting and an opportunity to really understand where variation comes from. Thanks, Mike. Um, Michael, God, I oh, you got to turn your mic on. Uh, I'm a quantitative geneticist who works mainly in uh, domestic animals. Um, I agree with Alison that there doesn't seem to me to be any hard distinction between biological traits and social traits. Uh, you have to worry about environmental effects in, in all of them. Uh, there might be more indirect effects in, uh, in social traits. In, in livestock, we've long recognised maternal effects. So the, the effect of the mother on the phenotype of the offspring and this can be partly genetic and partly environmental. Uh, there's no reason, of course, not to have a paternal effect as well in the model for the effect of the father. And it could be you know, partly driven by his genotype and partly by environment. Uh, more recently, people have looked at uh, what for a human audience I'll call housemate effects. Uh, for example, if you're a hen, the other hen's in your cage. And it turns out that uh, it, for some traits, they have a large effect. Uh, and you could study this, you could put uh, housemates in the model, both their genotype and their uh, non-genetic effects. It means that if, if you have a, if your housemates are your brothers and sisters, so your genotype will be correlated with, with theirs, that when you do a GWA, you'll pick up both a direct effect on the, the target person, but also the indirect effects from their uh, sibs or housemates. Uh, so that, that's a, an interesting model that's uh, probably worth exploring in, uh, in human data. Thanks, Aaron. Hi. Um, so my name is Aaron Panofsky, and I am a um, sociologist, but rather than a sociologist who applies uh, genetic uh, techniques in uh, the study of sociological dynamics or, or variables, I'm a sociologist who studies scientists and how they think about uh, and uh, use uh, various tools in their work, and also how their tools are used in, in broader social contexts. So, um, I wrote a book about um, the field of behavioral genetics and its its history over the last um, you know sixty or seventy years, and um, I guess I would take maybe a, a slightly contrary position to what's been taken so far on the panel, which is that I think that lots of fields, um, and this goes back to our questions about interdisciplinarity and what it would mean to collaborate, but many fields actually take very different uh, definitions of, of behavior, very different definitions of traits. And um, I'm not sure they're all commensurable necessarily in, in the way that we have discussed. I mean, I guess what I would say in some sense is, um, though I agree that uh, social versus biological, there's, there's uh, entanglements between them, but I'm not sure that that, that distinction or the traitification of behaviors or, or human attributes is necessarily uh, exhausts the way we might think about um, behavior uh, and so forth. Yesterday, I asked a question about um, uh, changes in, in drug addiction over time or drug response or even what drugs are available in a society over time. And I think that the, the broader sort of cultural contexts uh, are deeply implicated with what we think a behavior or what we think a trait might even be. Um, so it, let me just give you two quick um, examples. One is that, you know, so in the, for historians and cultural anthropologists, um, the idea, so this isn't a topic anyone's brought up today, but I think it's a topic that GWAS has studied, um, so sexual orientation, right? So there's a controversy over whether sexual orientation is actually a thing, right? So this is a way that we conceptualize sexuality uh, in our contemporary society. Um, but first of all, there hasn't always been a category of homosexuality, right? That category is a, a relatively modern and recent 
uh, invention. And it's not obvious when we look cross-culturally that sexual orientation, right, that there's sort of a deep, uh, that we each have a deep um, uh, con orientation towards certain sexual, uh, towards certain objects as, a, as a, an expression of sexuality and objects being other people usually, um, that that is always true in all societies. So does it, so, so what is it, so I guess that, that just raises the question of what it means to do something like a G genetic study of something like sexual orientation and whether we can sort of say that that generalizes and tells us something about humanity writ large as opposed to a certain slice or way of thinking about um, things in one in society. Uh, I think disability is a similar one, right? Disability isn't just a, you know, you have some uh, biological defect, uh, but it is an entire sort of gestalt, a whole way in which uh, society deals with you. Uh, and it's also a moving target, right? So um, I just filled out one of those forms, you know, and I was like, oh, wait, I, I'm just, I, I, you know, I never thought of myself as dis disabled, but when I went down the list, I was like, oh, I guess I have to check this box and, you know, for one of the things that is really mi mild. Uh, but, you know, so these things change over time. So I'll stop there. Um, but my question, my general question is just, I'm not sure that um, that tradification is a, a universal way to think about, um, about human possibility or human differences. Thanks, Aaron. AJ? Hi, everyone. I am a gossiper. So I'm not from none of those disciplines. Um, my background is uh, I come from music and I have a bachelor's in journalism, a master's in anthropology with a specialty in evolutionary medicine, which I taught for 14 years. Uh, then I went into public health and got a second master's in applied biostatistics. And then I have a PhD in psychometrics. So I gossip about data and I measure shit. That's what I do. Um, when thinking about this topic and the conversations I've been hearing over time, let me give you a brief example. So what I do in the field of Alzheimer's now is try to track racism from across 100 years and map that onto Alzheimer's disease risk for populations that have greater risk, like people racialized as Black and people racialized as Latinx. And what we find in my studies is that racism, often before the, popu the, the individuals in the study were born, is associated with their cognitive decline over time. Now, why would that be? And this speaks to the question that was sort of raised in the previous panel, which is sort of the relationship of population health and family studies. It is impossible to tease apart inheritability in utero exposure, early exposures from a legacy of racism in our entire world. And so before we get to a place where we want to better genetically capture these sort of in-family differences, why don't we start seeing how these things cluster based on the facts, based on structural sexism, not gender, based on structural racism, based on capitalism. Let's see if these things are getting underneath the skin and then we can start to tease apart whether or not these things are inherited or not. Thanks, AJ. Jonathan? Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Pritchard. I'm a population geneticist and I'm filling in for Graham Coop. And I can only imagine my main qualification for this is that I have similar accent to Graham. <laughs> um, so I want to think a little bit about the kinds of um, goals of different sorts of studies and like what do we want to use these types of approaches for, and I think that that has a big impact on how we should think about it. So um, I wanted to highlight three different areas. So, so one is how do we learn about biology from GWAS? A second is how do we do um, personalized prediction for medicine? And then a third is um, how do we use ge genetics in other fields? So for example, in behavior genetics and, and sociology and so on. And so I think that these really, um, should drive us to think about you know, different aspects of the design. And so for the first one, um, for learning about biology, you know, I think we care a lot about learning about um, both general mechanisms of biology, as well as perhaps identifying 
specific genes that can be druggable targets. And so for this, I think that um, uh, a lot of the things that we need to do are sort of more on the functional side. Um, I think that I, 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 talked, I spoke briefly yesterday about how um, I think there's a, a huge need for understanding how um, you know, sort of what, what are the mechanistic links between genetic variation on one end of the scale and, and uh, you know, disease on the other end of the scale. So how do effects flow through gene regulatory networks? How do they affect cellular phenotypes? How do they affect tissues? And, you know, how does that flow through to organisms? So those are, in many cases, sort of functional and, and lab-based questions in, in my mind. Um, I, I do think actually, this is a separate discussion, but I think there's actually still a lot of space for collecting exome data. There's some really interesting work, for example, from Luke O'Connor showing that we can get um, different kinds of information from exomes than we can from GWAS. So, um, so anyway, so that, that's one set of questions where we want to learn about, about biology from, from GWAS and, you know, that hopefully affects, you know, medical interventions and as well as our basic understanding. Secondly, um, you know, there's personalized prediction. And um, so we, we heard, um, for example, from Bogdan today and uh, from Jen about, um, about PGS scores. And here, I think that it's, it's clearly essential to, um, you know, think much more broadly about, you know, how, how individuals are situated in in their, their, their specific environment, their specific environment, their, their communities, how these things intersect with race and, and uh, genetically defined ancestry and, and many other factors. So, so I think that for that personalized genetics type of goal, we need to be much, much, much more comprehensive than we do on, on the biology kinds of questions. And, you know, so I thought the talks today were really inspiring about how we might approach that and these are these are really challenging problems and then the, the use of genetics and you know in sociology and behavior genetics that, that's probably the place where I'm, I'm least commented least qualified to comment but I, I as far as I can see that um, you know that has much maybe in some ways more in common with the the you know what I was describing as the personalized genetics sorts of questions um, but you know there I think we you know, we really need to be in, in conversation with, with the people in this room and outside who are, are experts in those spaces to, you know, to think about, well, what are they actually the questions that, that they want to answer and how, how does genetics intersect with that and how, you know, how can we as a genetics community be useful to them? So, thank you. Great. Um, so I'm, as I said, uh, Graham couldn't be here, but I'm going to read out his comments. I'm not going to do the accent. I, sh I should have Jonathan on this. <laughs> Graham was my postdoc advisor, so I, I could actually do it. But <laughs> uh, so there are many axes that we could place traits along, and the usefulness of those axes will depend on the questions we want to ask. I'm not convinced that the biological versus social axis is a very useful one for, for many of the complex traits that we as geneticists study. Many human complex traits, at least those studied by geneticists, will be influenced by the interaction of genetic and social environment played out through physiological, developmental, and behavioral processes that will be shaped by social interactions from early childhood onwards and will be subject to change as societies change. So a dichotomy of GWAS traits as social or biology likely is unhelpful. I do think that a useful axis for complex traits geneticists to think about is the extent to which trait GWAS are confounded by genetic and environmental confounding and indirect effects. This falls within this discussion because one source of this confounding is due to traits uh, shaped by social phenomena of how individuals, families, groups, and societies organize themselves through assortative mating, migration, and the transmission of environments across generations. And uh, two, the number of behavioral traits GWAS, uh, to a number of behavioral traits on GWAS are outliers on this confounding axis and shows strong evidence of multiple sources of confounding being compounded together, consistent with at least some behavioral traits being seriously confounded by social phenomena. This poses serious issues for the interpretation of these GWAS and raises question about the utility or at least the applications of GWAS approach for understanding these traits. While the confounding itself might be an interesting source of questions about social processes, uh, the fact that multiple sources of confounding are compounded together, combined with the distance between genotype and phenotype, make it not at all obvious to me that the field will find traction on these problems. Very cheerful there from Graham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Michelle, yeah. I have an interesting one that, that basic uh, observation that basically links to what Aaron was saying and, and also uh, Graham like had you read out. And that yesterday when you said like, well, what if addiction is different 70 years ago? And and I'm a psychologist, so that's a super interesting question because like in psychology, sometimes addiction is viewed as very medicalized. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, for example, in the south of the Netherlands, people on average, uh, very much white and, and of low SES, they're addicted to GHB, whereas in the US, they're addicted to different substances. Right. Is that even the same thing? And so where I think GWAS can be very useful is if we let go of the idea of GWAS as anything like biology, biology or any other thing. But is to GWAS addiction in the 70s and to GWAS addiction now or to GWAS addiction in the Netherlands and, and here and do a genetic correlation. And we're not saying genetic correlation would reveal biology. I'm just saying if it's low, that just points to the fact that those addictions aren't the same thing. They have different sets of causes, right? And those and that they're just like, so it's more of a, there it becomes more in, in psychology, I think genetics more becomes a, a medium to correlate things that are very far away. I would almost advocate dropping the word genetic from that correlation because it will confuse the hell out of people, right? But the correlation doesn't, isn't caused as caused by genes in a very, very remote sense. Uh, but it's, it's a very useful indicator of, of things changing in our society, right? So yesterday there was the example of, of statins changing who gets heart disease. Well, we know about statins. That's tractable. Many things in sociology and psychology in the fields we I sort of move around in, they aren't tractable at all. So it's it's to me, it's like analytic gold to be able to go like, well, actually the addiction wave you're studying there in the eighties for that certain substance, it actually, it doesn't share any of the top hits with my addiction one, because it's a different substance. So maybe the nicotinic receptor gene has nothing to do with your drug, right? But the genetic correlation is low or high, which points to like either shared or separate causes. So. I would advocate, especially in the social sciences, we can find uses for genetics, but it does mean we have to talk about like sort of what genetics then means. Then it, it just becomes a medium to correlate things that are very far apart in time or in space. And I think that's a really genuinely useful use of genetics. It's just not a common one, uh, but it has important implications. Say we find that like the different ways of addictions that occur throughout time have different sets of causes, right? That tells us something about interventions and and, and, and how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of me responding to Aaron and some of the other things. Can I build on that? I think the irony of the conversations that I've been hearing for the last two days is that you've always only been using social traits. Um, the fact that things were built on race or built on height were never genetic factors. Like there, for me, um, and I think a lot of anthropologists share this vision is that there's a lot that happens underneath the skin and the degree to which it needs to be a genomic or a genetic level shift is greater than some of the conversations that we're having. And uh, I appreciate Melinda uh, using the term shock. Um, in this, because I often think that we're conflating everything underneath the skin together um, and using these genetic approaches to sort of talk about social issues through using words like ancestry, which is highly conditioned on social factors. And sometimes I resent the use of terms like self-identified because I felt like it's really rude. Like you gave me a list of categories and told me to pick that. That's not self-identified. I'm self-identified as AJ. I am who the hell I am. You told me to choose a category. So that is already a social condition by which you forced me into. And then you're going to pretend as if it's correlated with some kind of genetic or continental ancestry. So I almost feel like we should step back and acknowledge that we're not talking about what we think we're talking about. It was all made up. Can I, um, I want to push on Michelle's point as well, um, and m maybe channeling Graham's comments a bit here. If, if you do find that low 
genetic correlation between addiction in 1970 and addiction now, or you find a high one, do you know that the causes are different or, or, or is this, you know, how do you know when the causes are different versus you're, you're picking up some kind of shared structure? So if we believe sort of that the set of the total set of causes of, of an, an outcome, right? So that's, that's like society, that's like a billion things, right? That, that feed into something like addiction. Um, if, if most or some of those, right, are heritable, that heritability will propagate into it. And it doesn't even have to be that it, it's a heritable cause. Like if we were to, well, you know, if we, if we in society sort of like select people on genotype, which we do all the time, right? There's all kinds of selection mechanisms in society. So I'm not even saying a gene causes anything. It just could be society filtering on the gene. You know, it, most apparent, I think, in, in beauty ideals, right? Society decides what it's a beauty ideal. That's literally just, you know, society deciding what genotypes get to be represented in a magazine, right? So I'm not even saying it has to be a biological cause, but all those things will filter into your GWAS of that thing. And so if the set of causes were to stay the same, then, then there's no reason to believe that like the genetic correlation between a thing in the seventies and now would change. Whereas if the, if the set of things going into it changes, right, you'd expect the genetic correlation to go down. Right. And so you, you aren't certain, but there's many, many sort of fields of study in psychology that I'm familiar with where, where we've been talking for ages about, you know, how psychiatrists in different countries perceive a certain disease, how stigma is different about different symptoms. And so is depression really the same in different countries? Uh, maybe not even at the level of the psychiatrist, maybe not even, and those things cannot be like empirically resolved. Right. And that doesn't always need to be. Sometimes just the observation is sufficient, but if you do a GWAS of, of depression in, in, in two of those cultures where you, where you have this inkling that actually they're very different constructs and, and, and people have done that and you find a genetic correlation of 0.4 between depression in individuals of Asian ancestry and European ancestry. And I agree, confounding a lot of things, because the people that do the GWAS, they're not thinking of social science, right? They're just combining every sample they can get from many different Asian cultures. So it's, it's not a great sort of like way to do it. It's just as an illustration, that correlation is 0.4. It's way higher for other psychopathologies that, that are thought of to be less heterogeneous across uh, a culture and context. And so I think that is that is useful information. I think that is sort of like actually something we can find a place for in social science. It does require redesigning some of the GWASs with, so, with social scientists in mind, right? Because, you know, to, but anyway, I think it's very, it's, it is a useful use of genetics and it's just a social use of genetics. And it's not a, it doesn't even get to biology. It's just like, we're using it as an indicator at that point. So um, let me, let me try and synthesize briefly and then, and then go to questions from the audience. So. What I'm hearing is we had one axis along which the discussion uh, was supposed to proceed, and and every panelist has has rejected that axis in one form or another. Um, that the idea that there's a there's that this is the right axis, behavior versus social, and multiple reasons for that. You know, one being that you always have to consider both environment and genetics anyway. So you know, uh, what's the point? Uh, and another being that you know all. Um, all traits are in some form social as well, because they're, they're socially determined, uh, even if they're under the skin. Um, and I think this idea um, that Aaron brought up of tradification, I think is very interesting, um, because maybe there's a sense in which we find it easier to tradify biological qualities than, than social ones. Um, but that's all I wanna say, and I wanna go to audience questions. Can I? Can I say something about that? Sure. Just as, as somebody who studies behavior, I just have to say something about like how hard we work to try to make sure that we measure things reliably. And um, I totally grant that measurement is a really important question. Um, but there are, so I study non-human animals and um, 
we do all sorts of things to make sure that what we're taking data on and how we're observing can be repeated, that it's it's repeatable, it's replicable across observers over time, et cetera. And so I, I always just get a little bit defensive, like, oh, behavioral traits, they're so messy and you can't really study them because you can't really quantify them. And I just want to push back a little bit that um, we that is something that we worry about a lot and have um, come up with methods to, to try to address. Can I just add to that? Sure. Uh, the, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree completely with with what you said, but uh, and and really, in in some ways, we're making life too difficult. A, a, a lot of this isn't so difficult. I studied uh, fearfulness in both cattle and in dogs. Every dog owner that I've met who's got a free, fearful dog says it's because somebody mistreated it. But in fact, the heritability of fearfulness is fifty percent. It's, it's easy to measure. You can run selection programs and they work. There's no doubt it's genetic. Um, there are also environmental effects. Nobody's denying that. But fearfulness is it's, it's really no different from studying height or weight or something. You, know, it's, it's, you, you have to measure it correctly. You have to put some effort into it. But it, you, get, you get answers by doing the actual empirical science not by not by philosophizing about you know how complex it is i, I want to like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i want to i want to push back a bit and i'm gonna like end up in an eric turkheimer corner something i never <laughs> thought i'd ever do but like if 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 people treat dogs of a certain breed badly they become fearful and that would be heritable right so like the, the causal mechanism causing the heritability doesn't have to come from the biology. Because if we like all decide to treat the same type of drug very badly and they all become fearful and you would do what she was, you would find hits. You could even breed it out through a selection program because the dog we all sort of treat badly would disappear. And there's like no way your experiment and my experiment looks so when, yeah, maybe you don't need philosophy if you want to just get a, an allele to go and like, Improve the disease, great. But like in many other applications, you do need the philosophy because it kind of does matter <laughs> fundamentally whether it's like true that the dogs are getting, you know, because the, the easier intervention than the breeding program is then to like, you know, maybe make sure people aren't being assholes to that kind of dog. Right. So I don't know. You kind of do need the philosophy. Okay. I want to go to the audience now. We're having a good time up here. But. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question online from Neil Rich. It goes back to the tradification point. He says when large biobanks were constructed, like the UK biobank, some of these social factors like SES, educational attainment, were conceived as social risk factors or social determinants. They weren't considered as health outcomes themselves. So what, at what point did the social determinants themselves become medicalized and tradified? So the end of Sandra's question was, at what point did the social determinants determinants become medicalized. Do you want me to get at that? I, I often think that um, the problem we have is just like, maybe people deleted history or they think that what happens outside the lab or our work environments are some separate world we step into. But we're not different people when we cross those spaces and our history does not change. So that history of eugenics. So one of the thing is, things I track a lot of our historical movements into specific decisions made by institutions. So I often track European colonization that we're living the effects of to Greek colonization of what becomes the Middle East, Northern Africa, and into parts of Asia, because it's that strategic movement of deciding people are different and then treating people differently based on this rule they created that then trickles down into all of our societies. That's the same thing when it comes to eugenics and science. We often push out to your example, the bad apple of eugenics in the way we do science and go, oh, that's rare. That's only a few people who did that. But that's actually the foundation of westernized science is to justify the social stratification that was occurring. So our science is never separate from it. It's always embedded in that, and we're always trying to overcome it 
through our rigorous methods and models. But at some point we can't. So I would say that it didn't become medicalized. It started medicalized because we started producing anthropometric uh, assessments of cranial size to justify who was more intelligent. We started studying black bodies and indigenous bodies to justify them being different than white bodies. We started there. That is our foundation. Are we going to decide to create a boundary between what is social and behavior? Now, that is a choice that does not mean that it's true. I have a question to you to follow up. So I, I usually see sort of like, and I've worked on social outcomes in GWAS, right? I usually see well done social science genetics, if it's really done well, as a force to sort of dis and basically to sort of like adjust perceptions about this, like the within family heritability, like so saying that's a lot of genetic gene environment correlation. That work stems from doing a genetic study of education. You can't really get to like all the things we learned about how if we do solid control, the heritability of those traits is far lower than than, than we thought like say 20 years ago. Um, so I always, always thought like doing the social science genetics, but doing it like really with a high fidelity and well is a solution. But do you, do you, do you sort of, what's your perspective on that? This kind of taps into something that was said earlier about case studies that Arbol was getting at. I think there's no better case study than knowing the history that European nations were in the dark ages in the 1300s and 1400s in poverty and starvation and through the act of colonization have become the better health of the entire world. There's no better case study for how social factors can shift in just a few generations the health of a whole population. How you can go from self-governance in indigenous societies with great health to the poorest health in a society such as ours. Some of us experience that just in our lifetimes. You have a shift in the resources that you have. Your health uh, entirely changes. And so I think we almost have like the, the, the case studies in front of us to demonstrate. We just don't ask those questions because they become this sort of colorblind. We don't see them. They just exist. Like that's just air. There's no need to name that. That just is what it is. What we need to name is why you're deviating from the norm. Why is your standard deviation far off from where we expect it to be? Why is why when we compare you to everyone else, why do you regress to the mean? We're used to these sort of ways of asking questions, but I think we have the case studies to get at what we really want to know about how the genes uh, inter uh, interact with our environment. Several. Oh, yeah, there were see, a couple. Arbella is Mike. That seems like a good guy. And then guy. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to to build on some of the the comments by the panel members and also uh, link to some of the the comments made um, uh, late in the previous panel. Is that you know I, I just feel remiss if I don't say this. Uh, stratification is not a trait. It's a limit on our ability to do causal uh, inference. Uh, and it's been shown in, in various ways to be a serious uh, limitation on GWAS data in particular, uh, or, you know, where, where uh, you know, correlation is not causation in the most, uh, uh, in, in, in myriad ways. And, and so, you know, I'm, if, if I'm even willing to go with, you know, Michelle on, uh, you know, there, there's uh, something to be said about uh, or to be learned from a difference in genetic correlation between, you know, two societies or uh, something of the sort. You know, I think there's, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that is the case. I'm uh, much more convinced that there's uh, a lot of harm done by, you know, just just putting out there the genetic correlation between same sex behavior and risk taking uh, from questionnaires to 23 me participants and uh, or or you know, from, from uh, just, you know, proposing that people's genotypes make them move next to a highway or uh, to a coal mining region where their risks of uh, asthma are 
cardiovascular disease is, is higher. Um, I think there's real evidence of, of the, the harm that uh, we're doing with that, and, uh, and, and it's uh, much less clear that we're learning anything about um, mechanisms, including social mechanisms, by uh, using uh, genetics, even if just as a proxy. Maybe we can go to Naomi in the back. Um, I just wanted to add to the discussion about the genetic correlation estimates that uh, Michelle was talking about, that I feel like there's not enough benchmarking when people do genetic correlation. So um, when we did the, actually the first study of estimating genetic correlations from GWAS data, which was across the psychiatric disorders, I made sure that we did estimates of genetic correlations between data sets of the same disorder as well as between the different disorders and showed you know very high genetic correlation between the schizophrenia groups lower between the bipolar groups and you know even lower between major depression and so then when you go across ancestries often people estimate a low genetic correlation and interpret it as an ancestry effect whereas in fact it's a phenotype effect and so yeah just advocating for more benchmarking when people do these studies yeah i mean i, I wasn't saying it was an ancestry effect I was saying it, it was a phenotype effect, right? The phenotype, is, and that's sort of like, this is the difficult thing when talking about genetics. It's like, I am interested in phenotype effects. Like what, why is that phenotype different in a different culture? Uh, and is it different in a different culture? Or is it different over, you know, 20 years from now? Is it different 20 years back? And sort of, I, I really respect your perspective on this and I, I I do admit that there is sort of risk for misuse of all these data right because we speak freely now about scientific things but take them out of context and give like a subtle spin on what I said and you risk instilling sort of like oh there's like genetic differences in the depression between these two ancestries like I wasn't speaking about ancestry and that's really difficult and hard to disentangle maybe maybe it in the limit we can't and then maybe we shouldn't do all of those things right so maybe there are things then we shouldn't study that that, that may be a reasonable outcome um i'm not entirely convinced that's the case i i i do think people like in psychiatric research deeply struggle with intercultural differences in our diagnoses and i think those are genuinely important questions to ask uh i think the same with like over time i am very curious to see whether psychiatric diagnoses of 50 years ago would correlate the same with each other or how would they correlate to ours now if they morphed into different ones like those are like genuinely interesting questions i think for for psychiatrists to ask and 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 you're right there are phenotypes where where that's harder to sell and there are situations where maybe people are naive to what their you know little number means outside the context and that's something we should definitely continue to evaluate and, and discuss and but I, I do feel by being open about that like i think that social science genetics or psychological genetics can only really work if we de-essentialize it right and say like these are not biological effects genetic effects are not biological effects they're just correlations as you said they aren't causal and the correlations can be used in something in a, in a different study, but we have to do both of those things at the same time. So otherwise we're putting out numbers that like live in a different context than we, we intend them to live in. And that's, that, that is uh, consequential. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I almost feel like we have to make a decision about what we want to do about our findings. And that's to my point about why we keep feeling like we're scientists during the day and then we walk out and we're an individual, a mom, dad, whatever the case may be at home. Reality is, is those findings have real implications for how we understand humanity and how we treat each other, how we structure our societies. So almost would rather you first make a declaration on what you're willing to, the places where you're allowing your science to blur with your political self uh, and then do the science because then it won't be about protecting some way we've been doing it and it will be about um, how it actually provides some benefit. Because I'm thinking in that example, if we determine that when you put people under these oppressive socioeconomic environments, they tend to, there's some kind of 
gene expression that allows for this behavioral trait of um, uh, alcohol consumption or some other kind of drug to be used, then what? The implication is on you as the scientist, then what? Are you willing to advocate for then changing your society so that we don't put people under those kind of conditions? Or is it just a finding you walk away from? You publish and you're done and that's not my job, that's someone else's job. So what if we complicated our findings in a different way? Uh, Jen? Oh, oh um, sorry, look, um, look, uh, do you have yeah. a mic, Jen? No, go ahead. Maybe go ahead. Logo and then we'll give the mic to Jen. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. It's, uh, it's great, great food for thought. Um, I was trying to reconcile some of the points made by Aaron and uh, the great point made by AJ as well, and I was reflecting on this tradification, and I thought, okay, well, we can GWAS anything that varies, right? If it varies, we can try and achieve us it. But then I was want to question to the panel: Do you think that the fundamental problem is is the variance and whether variance means inequality? Hallelujah. So that's for you. Anyone want to respond to that? I was trying to give other people a chance because look, now you're speaking my language. One of the problems we have when we map structural racism, so we have a measure for people racialized as black and a measure for people racialized as Latinx. And I have a couple colleagues that I'm building on other metrics for. Um, it does not vary. Racism does not vary over time. Um, when we use sort of, and I'm not a fan of principal components, so it's just so disheartening to hear it repeatedly used over and over again as something that's so high stakes, like um, alleles, but you know, whatever. Um, when we use our approaches like um, a class analysis or some other kind of latent modeling to look at differences, we find that it's often a shift at 1970 in our data where racism starts to look differently in this country. Now, I know my history, so I know 1968, the Fair Housing Act occurs, that allows for desegregation in our country to occur. So then we have to shift our model to look at racism differently after that time period. What if, I mean, and this almost piggybacks on Michelle's question, like what if we shifted our statistical approaches based on our understanding of history because it better maps onto what we expect. So then maybe variation is not the key. Maybe we are just comparing means or medians at a given time. Um, I often say anything past 1990, I expect variation. I expect my country to have changed enough that there is variation in racism. Now, that's not the case data wise, <laughs> but that's an expectation we can hold. And then I compare the data based on that expectation. But I do think variation is a big problem in our expectations. Can I? Yeah. So I'm not sure if this exactly addresses this, but this is another point that I thought might be interesting to make. So sociologists of health or health sociologists sometimes um, have this uh, notion of fundamental causes. And so this idea of fundamental cause comes from something like, why is it that in a variety of societies, uh, in a variety of time frames, uh, folks at the lower uh, that are defined as lower SES by their societies keep having different and worse health outcomes usually, but but low SES is a completely different configuration in different times and in different places, um, and so you know at one place it's uh, not having a refrigerator or a TV is low SES, but in another place, that's a completely, you know, terrible mod measurement of low SES, or, it, you know, it might be something else. Um, and so what sociologists have, have tried to think about there is like, even with all this change, we still have this relationship between class uh, or class status and, um, and health status. So actually, um, it's, it's, it, it's that we should not think of those, uh, we should not measure those things in an extremely precise way, or we need to uh, understand in kind of maybe or an indexical way or something that uh, emergent problem in social 
uh, in different societies that is not reducible to the measurable operationalizable um, elements. And so that's sort of um, maybe a, a, a different way of thinking about the way that structures work, um, but that are, I mean, so this is a, a little bit of a, a like, while, even though while I um, am very um, assured that you can, you know, measure uh, complex behaviors in, in um, animals in a very precise way, in some ways, um, maybe a lack of precision or a recognition of continuities between things that ostensibly look very different in different contexts uh, might tell us a lot more about, uh, about outcomes. Jen's question, and then we wrap up. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few things about complexity. I find time and time again, as a field, we tend to shy away from complexity um, based on, you know, the questions we can ask with stats, methods, and other things. But I do think we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot in a way. Because if you think about a lot of other fields that try to interrogate the health of populations, they embrace complexity. It's a feature, not a bug. Mm -hmm. And our colleagues are much more comfortable with that, which is sort of another reason for collaboration. But then also to the points of medicalization of a lot of these traits, now we're relying more and more on biobanks in which things have to be medicalized. We're looking at billing codes, right, which are not there to capture the nuances necessarily of outcomes, but to chase the numbers. We're sort of collapsing many fee codes down to these categories and sort of Maybe that's not the best way even to find the mechanism, right? If you're having this sort of um, amalgamation of different outcomes into one trait, right? And so I, I wonder about, you know, with these different axes and that the complexity, is there a better way for us to move forward that embraces this complexity and acknowledges it in all of our studies, the way that other fields might do so um, to sort of help us, you know, navigate a path forward that, that allows us this sort of breadth of expertise um, and questions. All right, and I think we're going to let that be the last word, and uh, we'll have lunch. Let's thank the panel.